Hello everyone, and uh, this is part two of my lecture on the skeletal system, uh, covering major parts of the skeletal system. Um, again, as I said in, in part one, this is uh, for an introductory level high school anatomy class. Um, specifically for my anatomy students, hence the blanks that are in it. This is the way that I normally would teach my students. Um, so if you uh, are here and you're not one of my students watching this video, uh, feel free to try to fill in the blanks as you go and kind of serve as a self-quiz uh, for you. So this is part two. Um, there's still a lot to cover, um, so let's get started. So osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So these are two types of, of bone cells that are doing a variety of functions within the bone tissue. So the way that I type those in there, because they, they only differ by one letter, uh, blasts with a capital B and class with a capital C. Now they're not normally spelled that way, but I did that to help you remember what they do. So cells that build up bone, and so I put a capital B there for build up, and the B for blast. So blasts build. They build up bone, they make a new matrix, then they mineralize it via enzymes that are going to convert this into a hard mineralized matrix. So these are the bone uh, building cells. Osteoclasts, uh, they're doing the opposite function of the blast. Clasts are cells that consume bone. Consume. So think of osteoclasts consume. They dissolve the mineralized matrix of bone by releasing hydrogen ions, which make it an acidic environment, then they digest it with enzymes. Again, enzymes are doing so many things in the body and carrying out so many processes, millions of them. Um, the dissolved minerals are put into the bloodstream when needed. So whenever it's time for more calcium or phosphorus to come out of the bone and, and put into the bloodstream to service some other tissue or organ of the body, it's the osteoclasts that are breaking that down. This is continually happening within us. This is all part of skeletal or bone homeostasis where blasts are building up and clasts are breaking down. Now, these osteoclasts, they contain many lysosomes, which are organelles within the cell uh, that contain many enzymes. And so that's why lysosomes are the organelles that contain an enzymes that break things down. So that's why it's important for osteoclasts to have so many of them, because they are so reliant on the enzymes so that they can do their job. And like I said, osteoblasts and osteoclasts work together to maintain bone structure homeostasis. Um, the next statement there explained braces on teeth. That's my reminder for me to, to put a plug in for the orthodontists out there. So um, how this happens, you get braces and your teeth move around. And orthodontists are able to make a plan to make your teeth move in just about any direction they want to. Well, how, how can they do this? You, you think the teeth are such static structures within embedded within the bones of our face but in actuality they they can be moved quite easily as any of as any of you who've had braces know that your your teeth and, and the way their their structure is and their angle can be transformed through the use of braces over a long period of time and so what happens is so you can imagine let's say you have braces over your uh, incisors and so what the braces do then is they, the orthodontist puts a certain amount of pressure on the braces themselves. And what that does is it, it, it slowly, gradually puts pressure on there. And on the, on the back side or the posterior side of the incisors, osteoclasts are doing their job getting rid of the, the bony tissue that are surrounding the roots of the teeth and, and the, the structure of the teeth. While uh, on the other side, the anterior side of the incisors, osteoblasts are building up bone because you know you got the you have the bone breaking down on the back, and so that's we, you don't want to have a gap on the uh, opposite side of the teeth. So the osteoblasts then will be building up bone. So they're working together to enable the teeth to be moving uh, and shifting within within our mouths. And of course, orthodontists take advantage of this, and they they develop uh, a plan for you to manipulate your teeth and to move them.
The epiphyseal disc, and, and I put in quotes, the growth plate is what we typically call it, cartilaginous tissue, hyaline, where um, growth or uh, mitosis occurs, as I said in, the, in part one. Ossification begins around age 17 and ends about 25 years old, and that's just generalized, um, but that's pretty much where it is for most humans, and the process is regulated by hormones. So hormones are are regulating when this should occur. When does the, the uh, process of ossification begin and, and when is it completed? And, and hormones are, are regulating this, this process. And you can see the difference in these two x-rays. You look on the one on the left, it's a three-year-old, lots of cartilage. So in an x-ray, white equals dense and gray or black means less dense. So you have a lot of gray areas there in the three-year-old, especially around this child's knuckles and in the wrist, you can see. And the, even the bones, the, 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 the metacarpals and the phalanges, and even the radius and the ulna all kind of look a little bit unformed or not fully formed. Uh, that's because there's, there's so much cartilage still uh, contained within their joints. And you compare that to the adult hand, you can see lots of white tissue. You can see the carpals are clearly outlined, whereas in the three-year-old child, they're, they, they are, are barely visible at all with the x-ray. Uh, and so this is, just shows the process of ossification from when we're a young child to when we're an adult. How do bones repair themselves? And then the process of remodeling as well, because they, it's a good time to talk about remodeling here. So a hematoma is a blood clot. Toma, uh, it refers to a, a large uh, growth, or, or um, you think of oma in, in terms of cancer and, and tumors. So hematoma, now this is not cancerous, it's, it's not a tumor. Uh, it's a blood clot, and also associated with that is inflammation and then pain as well because the nerve endings have been, uh, are being stimulated uh, from the, re the, the result of the release of many chemicals and then plus just the, the increase of fluid in that area putting pressure on the nerve endings. So when a bone is damaged, there, a hematoma forms first. Then a fibrocartilage callus, and, and a callus, you think of like calluses on the palms of your hands, for example. Massive collagenous fibers and fibrocartilage fills in the space of breakage. Then uh, phagocytic cells, phagocytic cells move in and clean up, white blood cells, and then reconstruction begins and the, the building up the, of the bone starts to happen. Then a bony callus forms. So we start with the fibrocartilage callus, then the bony callus. And then I put an O there just to see, do you, uh, can, you, can you think of, of which type of bone cells will move in to ossify? Those would be the osteoblasts. So the osteoblasts then move in, they ossify the fibrocartilage callus into spongy bone. So that's how bone repair functions. Now, remodeling then will occur all the time in us. So after the bone is repaired, then we go to the remodeling. But remodeling is not just with bone repair. I mean, remodeling is occurring all the time with us. This is, has to do with the uh, skeletal homeostasis. So the osteoblasts will build up compact bone. And then the osteoclasts are doing the opposite. They're breaking down the spongy bone and building the new medullary cavity. So in general, we have a three-step process here with remodeling. Osteoclasts break down bone, remove worn cells, and they deposit calcium in the blood. After about three weeks, the osteoclasts undergo apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death, so it's time for them to go. And by the way, they are phagocytic cells as well, so they are consuming things. Remember, they have a lot of lysosomes in them, so they're able to consume a lot of junk that happens to accumulate within the bone. Then osteoblasts, they reverse the work done by osteoclasts taking calcium from the blood, and then depositing, in the, depositing the calcium into the bone. And so this process is continually happening within us. And the more active you are, the more physically active you are, the more remodeling takes place, which is good because you're, you have a, a higher rate of changeover of cells, and your body is responding to the amount of physical activity that you're placing upon it. So remodeling is just continually happening within us. And this is a, requires quite a bit of energy in order to do this. A lot of ATP is necessary in order for remodeling to, 
to happen within our skeleton. So we'll look at fractures, and I, again, this is just uh, introductory, so I'm not looking at every single type of fracture that we have classified out there, but just the main ones. So two main types, simple, and then there are a few simple ones that I'm going to highlight, and then an open or a compound fracture. So let's look at simple first. So the bone is broken, uh, but the skin is not lacerated, so the broken bone stays within the skin. And whenever the skin then becomes lacerated, that opens up a, a, a host of other problems that can occur, primarily infection. So we have, I'm going to look at three uh, basic types of simple fractures. Transverse, which fracture occurs at a right angle of the bone. So a fracture comes in from the side. Imagine a, you're, a, you're a, a running back, for example, in a, in a, in a football game, and, and, and you have someone who, who comes, comes at you, a, a linebacker hits you at a right angle, right in the femur, breaks the femur. That's a transverse fracture. A green stick fracture is a fracture that occurs on one side of the bone. And it's called green stick because if you... Uh, imagine taking, uh, say, in the in the sp late spring or summer, you take a, a a thin branch from a tree and then you try to break it, and it kind of frays apart or breaks on one side, but the other side remains intact. That's why it's called a green stick fracture. Typically, green sticks happen among younger people, children, because their bones are still quite cartilaginous, and so the green stick fracture occurs there. And then comminuted is a fracture that results in three or more bone fragments. So this is where a bone has been hit with a lot of pressure, a lot of blunt force, uh, or it's been crushed, for example. That would be a comminuted fracture. And then an open or compound fracture. So the bone breaks and lacerates the skin. And as I said uh, just a couple of minutes ago, that increases the risk of infection. So now your, your first line of defense, the skin has been compromised, there is a hole in it, and now bacteria can get in, and so that increases risk of infection. And you can see these ones on x-rays here. You have a, a transverse fracture there on, on the left, and uh, see if you can guess what bone that is that has sustained this transverse fracture. Uh, you know, it's there's two of them running parallel, and it's the smaller one. Uh, that would be the ulna, transverse fracture of the ulna. The top there, you can see the carpals. Uh, in the middle one, that's a green stick fracture. And uh, can you guess what, what bone that would be? Uh, that, that too is an ulnar green stick fracture. And you can see how kind of like bows, it's not broken through completely. One side of the bone is still intact, but the other side you can see has been broken. And, and you can also notice in the x-ray there's a lot of gray, black areas. So this would be of a child. Uh, and then the comminuted fracture, and I think you can tell what that bone is. Uh, that would be the femur. Uh, totally broken apart in pieces. And then a compound fracture uh, at the bottom. Uh, this is uh, interesting. This was uh, from a, a website that was um, from a veterinarian, and somebody brought a dog to this veterinarian that was limping along the road, uh, had an open compound fracture, and the veterinarian repaired the dog's leg, and, and it was back in shape after a few weeks. So you can see the uh, four different types of fractures there. So what kind of treatments can be, uh, can be utilized for broken bones? Well, there are four main treatments. And some of, many of you probably have experienced the first one. You get a cast. So we want to immobilize the bones so that there's not more jostling or movement that's going on uh, with that bone. So we put the, the broken and affected area in a cast. And of course, the cast goes beyond the area of the break because we want to immobilize more than just that particular part. Uh, the second main treatment, surgery, in which screws and or rods can be used, as you can see in this x-ray of this person's foot. They had a, a fracture uh, there with their uh, first metatarsal. And what happened was uh, the medial cuneiform was starting to slip, and it fractured the bone, uh, the uh, proximal end of that first metatarsal. Uh, 
So what the orthopedic surgeon did was lifted up the arch of the foot and then ran a screw through it uh, to maintain its structure and stability. You can use e-stim and electrical stimulation speeds up healing and suppresses osteo... Okay, so you have a break. Which one do you want to suppress? The osteoblast or the osteoclast? You want to suppress the osteoclast function. You want your bone to not be broken down at this point. You want osteoblast. You want to encourage the osteoblasts and you want to suppress osteoclast front function and e-stim can do that. Ultrasound, they're often used in conjunction, both of them. Ultrasound also speeds up healing and it stimulates chondrocytes, which are cells that end, it has a suffix site, which are, are which refers to being a cell. These are cells that produce cartilage. So it stimulates and speeds up the process of making that fibrocartilage callus. Uh, we'll look at the skull next. So the skull has sinuses in them, which you can see in this picture here, the frontal sinus, uh, ethmoid sinuses there, and the maxillary sinus. So sinuses, they lighten the skull. So, I mean, that's not really, I suppose, that much of a benefit for us, but it does lighten the weight of the skull. There's so many bones that are in our skull, and they're, they're quite dense bones. So the sinuses then lighten the weight of the skull, and they give our voice resonance as well. And we all have different shapes to, and, uh, shapes to our sinuses, different sizes to our sinuses, and so that affects the resonance of our voice as we speak, and the sound waves travel through our bones and through the sinuses. That creates a unique resonance that we all possess. They act as a temperature buffer. As we breathe air in, if it's cold air, we can warm it up with our sinuses because sinuses are, are highly vascular, so there's, there's plenty of blood that's in there as well. They act as an air humidifier too because they're moist, and so they humidify the air before the air comes down into our respiratory tract. There's lots of mucous membranes there. Uh, as many of us are aware, especially during allergy season, when the mucous membranes become inflamed, and then we develop what's called sinusitis. And notice the suffix of that word, itis, means inflammation or swelling. So the mucus uh, within the, in the, the sinuses, the mucus cannot drain properly due to inflammation. So you have swelling of the mucous membranes and so there are tiny little openings in our mucous membranes called ostea and uh, the mucus will uh, kind of diffuse its way through there or move its way through those tiny little microscopic openings. Well when the mucous membranes become inflamed those tiny little ostea or those tiny little openings they don't allow the mucus to get through and so it accumulates and then you develop pain and pressure. Sutures are held together by fibrous connective tissue. And so those sutures are holding the eight bones of the cranium together and they make this tight zipper-like uh, uh, joint within those bones, immovable joints, uh, so that uh, you, know, you don't want these bones to be slipping and sliding around. So these sutures then, they look like zippers, like the bones have been zipped up in numerous places on the skull. You don't want those bones to be moving around. And fibrous connective tissue is very tough and holds them together very well. Uh, next, just want to highlight some uh, unique characteristics of the infant skull. So uh, fontanelles, which means little fountains, um, those are fibrous membranes. As you can see in this fetal skeleton here, you can see the bony plates on the, the back of the, the fetus's skull and also on the kind of the, the lateral sides of the skull. The pinkish reddish area, those would be the fontanelles. Um, they're nicknamed soft spots, and so I put that in quotations. Soft spots is what we call them. They occur because of this protein that's called, uh, kind of interestingly, it's called noggin. This protein noggin delays the fusion of cranial bones. So these bones don't fuse together because of this protein noggin that's preventing their fusion, and which allows the skull to slightly compress during birth. And it also allows the, the brain to grow as well within the cranial cavity. 
Um, so as uh, if, a, if a baby is delivered naturally, not cesarean section, then these fontanelles clearly serve that purpose of allowing these the bony plates of the skull to compress together. And just I put this here because we look at infants and we think, my goodness, their heads look way too big for their bodies. Um, you can see the ratio, the infant's skull to body ratio is one to four, where the adult skull to body ratio is one to eight. So four infant skulls to equal the height of its body for an infant, whereas compared to an adult, it would take twice that many. And so we look at an infant and we think, <laughs> That's a, that's a big head for that body. <laughs> so anyway, that just shows the two ratios in comparison. Now, uh, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to stop here. I said this was in, in the first video it would be a two-part series, but I, I don't know. I guess I get a little verbose and I speak a lot. So I'm going to end it here because I don't want to go any longer because I've already gone uh, long enough. So I'm going to stop here and end part two, and then I will uh, pick up with part three then later. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this video and uh, please stay tuned for part three. Thanks for watching.